I'm comedian, writer, and suspected witch, Alexandria Love. And this is Drunkaturgy, the show where I grab a drink, preferably brown, and talk about interesting things, occasionally with interesting people who are also preferably brown. Today's interesting person is Jason Bayani, who is the artistic director of the Kearney Street Workshop in San Francisco. We talk about Manila Town, which is the historically Filipino district of San Francisco. And we talk about the intersection of arts and activism. Grab a drink and check it out. How are you, Jason? Yeah, I'm doing good. Yes. <laughs> where, where are you? Where are you zooming from today? Uh, right now, I am in St. Paul, in Minnesota. Uh, my partner lives out here, so we, you know. I've been chilling here since the beginning of June. Uh, about to go back in a bit. Well, I have an even more important question for you. What are you drinking? Yeah. I'm currently drinking this uh, vodka and LaCroix. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're cheating. That's water. Don't be shitty. <laughs> hey. hey, the vodka's still vodka. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It kind of looks like moonshine from where I am, but I. Oh, and I got, you got the I got white cloth. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm excited to talk to you. I was hoping that you could tell me a little bit about uh, about your uh, your workshop. What's the deal? What's happening over at Kearney Street right now? So Kearney Street Workshop, we're a 40, now 47-year-old uh, arts organization. No, wait, wait. Now we're in 1972, so yeah, we're, uh, we're about to hit 48 years now. Yeah, arts organization here in San Francisco. Um, yeah, we are a Native American arts organization. Uh, the oldest multidisciplinary Asian Pacific American arts organization in the country. Um, I've been doing this for uh, for a long time. So you're working at the intersection of a uh, cultural culture and art, uh, like uh, cultural influences. Uh, so I'm yeah. wondering um, how much does history, how much is like a local history, cultural history, come into play when you're planning your productions? We're very much guided, you know, by what the needs of artists we work with are. And I think that's, you know, I mean, I think it, our job as an organization is to really, really listen, you know, to, you know, what are the are creating, what, what, what their concerns are, what their beliefs are, and, you know, begin to kind of program uh, opportunities and spaces for them to be able to, you know, express that and really kind of bring, bring their, their ideas into conversation. That's so beautiful. You know, I feel like a, a lot of um, current uh, uh, media production companies and things like that are kind of like uh, using the cultural zeitgeist. Is that how you pronounce it? I've only ever seen it. Mm -hmm. written. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> but they're using uh, these new cultural conversations to kind of, um, I, I don't want to say take advantage of the situation, but the truth is that we have so many diverse multicultural voices that are kind of going unheard. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you guys have been ahead of the game by like 50 years. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think I think it's, it's, it's what had to have happened to last that long. You know what I mean? It's like, so Curtis Workshop went through a lot of different phases. And, you know, I mean, we're going to be talking about Middle Town. That's where we started inside of a place called the I Hotel. Um, and we, you know, had to move around a lot, um, you know, and one of the things I think that has kind of kept this organization going is that it always kind of looked towards the next generation. And, you know, as the artists began and the organizers of the organizations began to grow older, they always knew we have to look at the younger folks and see where, where our art and our culture is headed towards. And, you know, the organization has to reflect that. I, I was like a closeted theater kid growing up. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, I used to love the kind of working at like house stuff and like making sure all the lights. I was like the type A person. I was too afraid to ever get up on stage. And now I go up on stage and talk about abortion. And <laughs> We're talking about creating work that questions and moves against capitalism. We're talking about mm -hmm. Things like abolishing the police, abolishing prisons. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're talking I love about it. like, yeah, I mean, like, we're talking about like, uh, really kind of like 
uh, questioning and working against uh, our, our, our received notions of what gender and, and, and sexuality is. I mean, like, all those things that even from the beginning of when I started working here have come more into conversation. It's scary to, to let go of a lot of kind of the ways that we see things or the ways that we, what our, our belief systems are, you know, um, and to kind of move into something that's, you know, that's being told or being kind of like that, that you're being made to feel is an antithesis to this area of comfort that you've lived in your whole life when really you begin to understand the language then you begin to understand what this really is and what it's about and so I and like art can play such a huge role in being able to um, being able to make that language more understandable I think it is necessary that we talk about these things and we begin to reimagine what our world will look like you know, and that's something I'm learning from a lot of the younger artists that we work with now. I mean, art has a way of kind of making us uh, change our perspective on things, you know? Art mm -hmm. kind of shapes the world, you know? Um, yeah. uh, some of my favorite uh, pieces of uh, education have been things that I've learned from art, like artistic pieces. Um, okay, let's get to, let's get to the meat and potatoes here. Okay, yeah. tell me about yeah. Manila Town, and I want I want you to know that's about me. I'm I'm from Oakland, uh, so I know mm -hmm. exactly zero neighborhoods in San Francisco. I go there when I have to for oh, yeah. stand up, <laughs> yeah. but in general, I like being here. So tell I, I I'm completely new. <clears throat> Talk to me. All right, so when we're talking about Manila Town, we're talking about this area, right, right next to you know uh, Chinatown. Four Mile Square uh, that runs up until you hit like a little bit like up until you hit like the North Beach area and down to like where the financial district and the you know the uh, pyramid uh, the Trans America building that's what it's called right yeah, the Trans America building yeah, ah, yeah. ten points to Gryffindor <laughs> so yeah this this area used to be like populated by like you know a community of Filipinos. And, um, you know, that was because when, you know, a lot of the Filipinos migrated over here, you know, there's, there's different ways um, of, of migration from Philippines to America. Um, and when we talk about the migration ways that happened after the Philippine-American War, um, that was, you know, you had your first wave come in during the war with the uh, kids of the elite coming over to study at the American University, you know, and that's, of course, you know, that's, that's a military plan, you know, that's, that's a military strategy, right? So that they go back mm -hmm. and be like, oh, American, great. Um, but the next way that came after that were laborers. You know, they started off with sending uh, Filipinos to work, work plantation, uh, to work in Hawaii, in sugar and pineapple fields. And um, that was originally only supposed to be like, you know, they were only supposed to do for a couple of years and go back home. And that's why a lot of people did it. No one makes the money. But like what they're saying is like only really 50% of um, the Filipinos went to the Philippines, came back home. A lot ended up staying there. And so after, you know, so they started seeing that like, okay, you know, we can use these Filipinos for labor. So why don't we bring him in to work in the field and, um, you know, to work in the fields. And so like, there was basically um, a route that they had. They worked the fields in the summer and then during the winters, they go up to Alaska and work in the canneries. And so they you had this whole kind of route of Filipino laborers that came in and started coming in in the 20s and 30s. And uh, mo all men, pretty much, like uh, mostly men, and um, they're doing this route, and a lot of them too just ended up settling in San Francisco um, as well. Like, so when they moved to San Francisco, a lot of them were working in, um, you know, hotels or working in restaurants. But you know, San Francisco, of course, is very segregated. You know, 
especially like in the early days. And so like, you know, you they just were kind of like relegated into this kind of area. And uh, which became in that sounds like a three block area. And like you, and it was not safe for them to ever go out of it. And so um, you have folks come in there. There are also Filipinos that ended up being uh, the Fillmore, which we talked about last week. And um, remember, I was drinking a lot. <laughs> that was a well, joke. Like, you I can keep it. going. I watched it last week. But um, <laughs> yeah, so you have the Filipinos end up like in Mino Town, also in the South of Market area. Um, you know, so that, that, that can't happen over time. But, you know, when um, when the financial district was starting to, you know, build up and they're trying to put up the, the Transamerica building, they eventually were like, okay, we got to take this area because it's going to become our financial district and we're going to, like, take this over. So they started, like, kicking out families and the only thing that was really left was the I Hotel, which um, housed a lot of seniors. And those were seniors who were the same farm workers. Um, you know, they got older. This was an SRO. There was a community here. And, you know, it's kind of like, like I said, a lot of these men came over to work the field. A lot of them, and it was mostly men, so, you know, a lot of them didn't get married. Um, you know, there's not like a lot of token and women came over. There was kind of anti-miscegenation laws, so a lot of them really couldn't marry. If they had like a girlfriend who was white, a lot of them couldn't really marry. Um, you know, uh, what you call it, marry them. And so, you know, they a lot ended up, in, when they became old, a lot ended up in this in, at the hotel. And, um, you know, just a community that had been built there. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of, um, you know, the Iowa Hotel was like the last kind of spot that that um, was it, that held out. And even when they plan, when they planned to um, evict, you know, they had planned to evict the residents. I think there were they sent notes to evict the residents um, around 1968, I believe. And that was the first notice, but they were able to work out a deal um, to stay. But you know, it was only a matter of time because they want they they wanted that land um, and they wanted to kick it out. I mean, even like where he says that like this land is too valuable for poor people to be sitting on. And so you know, they knew what's happened with the area, and eventually, you know, what you call it, it took from. 68 to about 76, 77, um, you know, for the whole process of getting them kicked out, um, for this whole kind of process to happen, uh, for them to kick out the residents of the high hotel because they pretty much resisted. Wow. That was comprehensive. That was awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. not the, not the contents of, of the story, of course, but the way that you told it, um, I always find San Francisco he history to be super interesting. We, we think of new, we think of creative uh, ways to get like our message heard. And I think that's like, you know, where that is, a lot where that intersection exists. A lot of people like, you know, I think a lot of, um, especially when you're, you know, you're a person of color. Yeah, you know, like your art is always going to be political. You know, even if you're just writing a poem about the trees. <laughs> We're pretty much in the Soma now. And um, one of the things that happened when a lot of people got uh, kicked out of Manila Town is um, there was also another community in the Soma. And so the community in the Soma built over there. And that's where you know, a lot of resources were built and um, a lot of like nonprofits sprung up over there. And um, in the Soma, you have, you know, you also experienced over the last couple of years, like a huge amount of displacement. So it's kind of like, you know, it's like, you know, Phil Beyond gets to have one place 
we got to move to another place. And then they end up getting kicked out again. And that's kind of like, you know, we talk about gentrification in the film where we talk about gentrification on this point. And it's like all these things that just keep, you know, just like we keep having to like, you know, take what we can get where we can move and build a community there. And then someone goes, no, nah, I want that now. And I know that a lot of times in uh, communities like both of ours, when the mm -hmm. topic of displacement comes up, I, I, I think you're a lot more graceful than I am when I talk about it. <laughs> we talked about uh, both in the uh, in your Kearney Street workshop and uh, in the history of the Manila District. Um, we talked about the importance of the intersection of art and activism. And a lot of the times when uh, artists like you or me, I guess, uh, if you consider stand up to be an art, um, like us, uh, people say that we should keep uh, politics and our art separate. Uh, besides, fuck off, what do you have to yeah. say to those people? I mean, that's, yeah. yeah, and stand up is not like. <laughs> oh, please. You know, you, not when I do yeah. it, honey. <laughs> you, 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 it's not. You're like, you, can't, you can't separate it. Like, you can't. You know what I mean? And that's just, it's like, it's like, deal with it. It's, it's not going to be separated. When a lot of it was built off of like, you know, exclusion and then tokenization, you know, of people of color. I so, mean, I don't want to toot my own horn, but... <laughs> That's kind of what happened. Like, like the, the American music was created as a as a form of resistance of, from of uh, blackness against uh, white supremacy. That's what jazz mm -hmm. is, you know. And I just don't mm -hmm. understand how people think that there could ever be a, a true separation between art and politics. Because what what else do what else is there to talk about right now? Yeah. <laughs> if we if we talked about politics that uh, that they believed in then it would be a different mm -hmm. conversation. If, 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 our, if, our, if your art and my art was about all lives yeah. matter, then maybe people would listen to us a little well, bit more. <laughs> then, it, then, it would, then it would be shit art. It would so, be shit art! It would be shit art. <laughs> that's what it has to be. We have to make first, I mean, first and foremost, we have to make good art, and that comes from truth, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah remember that, uh, remember when that, uh, what's his name? He was like the defense secretary for Bush, or one of the defense secretaries. Bush. He had a he had a song. He had a song called "When the Eagle Soars." He wrote the song himself. It was a piece of trash. You're making this up. That's not fucking no, true. No, no, it is, it is. <laughs> I don't know if he was the defense secretary, but he was one of the cabinet members. For Bush what? Yeah, beautiful. That's what it is. Republicans cannot make good art. That's what it is. Can't make it. Can't make it. I've never seen it. Yeah. The closest I can think of is uh, that that photo shoot that Paul Ryan had at one time at that gym. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, so I I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to me. This was so much fun. Uh, I'll I'll let you have the final words. Uh, what what would you like to say to to put a bow on this awesome drinking conversation? Yeah, you know, um, the I Hotel came back. In, several years ago, there, so it's there. Um, it's still an SRO. Um, you know, even though it got taken down, even though know, um, it got torn down, um, you know, it took several years. Um, you know, and this is the messy thing about it: they tore it down, nothing happened to it. They were going to turn it in the parking lot, nothing happened. So eventually, community ways came back and were able to secure the space, um, turned it again into SRO and a community center. So, you know, you could still support the Manila Town um, Foundation today. They still do events over there, like on the weekends. Like, there's, they have classes. They do, like, you know, movie screening. Probably not as much right now because of coronavirus. But, like, it still operates, you know? And it, it, still, it still does the same. And uh, they're, still, they're still out there. Long live the I Hotel. Long live the I Hotel. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. Thank you.
Ayani for sitting down with me today. If you want to learn more about the Kearney Street Workshop or Manila Town or SF History in general, Google it? I don't know. Or use Bing. I'm not your mother. I also want to thank you for joining me on today's episode of Junkaturgy. You know, this show really is an intersection of all my true passions. Um, drinking, drinking during the day, and drinking on camera. Oh, and also, if you can think of any great Republican works of art, um, you can put it in the comments section of this video. I plan to rent the empty space as a parking lot. Join us soon for another episode of Drunk Turkey, but in the meantime, take a deep breath. Everything's gonna be fine.